In this video, I want to share with you six books that I believe every Christian should read this year. I've read these books recently and they helped me go deeper in my walk with the Lord and fall more in love with him because I got to see more how he's working in my life and how Jesus is working in the lives of the people of this world. Now, this is a big compilation of individual book reviews that I've done in the past, but I put it together in one video so that you can have it in one spot, you can listen to it in one go, and don't have to go to each individual video. There'll be time codes and chapters so that you can jump around and skip to whatever book you want to learn more about next. All these books are linked down below in my Amazon storefront, so feel free to check these out, grab them for yourself, or get them for a friend, family, especially as the holidays are approaching or people's birthdays are around. So check them out and let's get right into the first book. The Awe of God by John Bevere is a book that really challenged the way I thought about the fear of the Lord. You see, I always thought about it as this deep reverence and respect for the Lord, but this book actually touches on a component of the fear of the Lord that I had never heard of elsewhere and never really thought about before reading this book. I wanna share with you an overview of how this book is structured, a summary of his main idea, which is what I mentioned a little bit ago, as well as some of my thoughts and my personal opinions about this book after reading it, as well as a link that you can get yours for yourself. The interesting thing about this book is that it's structured almost similar to a devotional, but it's not a devotional. The book is designed in a way where each chapter builds on top of the one before, so you can't just drop into any chapter you want and then feel like you can get a hang of it, which you may be able to understand what it's saying, but it builds on top of everything before, so you need what you've read before in order to really work through what you're reading now. What distinguishes this book from many other books is A, the way it's structured like I just said, but also at the end of each chapter, there are these practical things that you can do to make it personal as it says. There's a passage that it recommends to read. There's a point based on what the chapter was mentioning. There's a ponder section where you can think about the question that it has written out. There's a prayer that you can pray. And then there's a profession, something that you proclaim or something that you can say. You don't have to, but it's, it's there to help you or allow you to read it and do something with it. Another distinct feature about this book is that the chapters really aren't that long. They're really I don't know, 10 pages or less, which makes it super fun to read because, especially with nonfiction for me, I don't like when the chapters are long because it takes a while to read because I'm a slow reader and I don't want to rush through it like a fiction book would. Looking at the table of contents, it's structured in a six-week format, meaning that each day you read one chapter and after six weeks you'll have made it through the entire book, or it mentions that you can read twice a day and you'll get through it in I think, what, three weeks then? If it's four, six, but you can read it twice a day, so that's three. I found myself when I was reading this slacking on some of the days and it ended up being days where I would double up on a chapter because I had missed the specific reading for that day. And I think I hindered myself from actually absorbing the material as much as I could have. I went through this book with a good friend of mine and it was great to meet each week to talk about how we applied each chapter or work through each chapter. But I could honestly tell that there were weeks where we would meet and I would say, yeah, you know what? I crammed and read all six chapters last night, so I couldn't apply it as much as I really hoped to. So what's the main idea of this book? Like I said before, it's about the awe of God. It's about the fear of the Lord, not specifically the reverence and respect for the Lord, which you should have, which this book does talk about. That is a foundational component. But what this book talks about about is this deep intimacy with the Lord in a way that you're afraid of losing that fellowship and intimacy with him. The example that he gave in this book is imagine you have a boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, father, mother, and you want to be loving with them. You want to be intimate, maybe not with a father, son, mother, daughter, father, daughter relationship, but husband-wife relationship, if you want to be truly intimate and in love with them, you can't be afraid of them. Why would you be able to give your all if you're afraid of them yelling at you or screaming at you or hitting you or that's an extreme, but an example. It would be silly to think and honestly, impossible for me to genuinely and truly love my wife if I was afraid of her. Like that just doesn't build the intimacy that would be considered love. And that's what this book talks about. This deep 
intimacy with the Lord, that you're afraid of losing that fellowship with him, which means then you want to flee from sin. You want to run away from sin and turn your back to it so that you can run hard after the Lord and that fellowship that you have with him. Let's pause for a second. The point I'm trying to make here is that this book talks about the fear of the Lord. It doesn't mean being afraid of the Lord because you can't be intimate with somebody that you're afraid of. And as Christians, we're called to have a deep, intimate relationship with the Lord. And if you're like me, you only really ever think about the fear of the Lord as this reverence, as this, no, like better, better make sure I'm not falling short here. But putting it in that deep, intimate fear of losing fellowship with the Lord way is pretty profound because that's just such a new idea for me when it comes to the fear of the Lord. There are two things from this book that really stood out to me that I have kept with me to this day after reading the book. I actually have them hold up. Wait a minute. Something ain't right. Aha, here we go. You probably can't see it. Um, maybe I'll take a video after. But on my watch face is actually two of the things that he talked about in his book that I put on my watch so that I can look at every day and be reminded of these things. The first is what obedience truly looks like. John talks about this for a good section of the book and there's five components to obedience. One, obey immediately. Two, obey when it doesn't make sense. Three, obey when you don't see a personal gain. Four, obey even when it's painful. And five, obey until completion. Those five measures of obedience are things that in moments of temptation that I experience, I say to myself, okay, obey immediately. Obey when it doesn't make sense. Obey when I don't see a personal gain and, and so on. Because I know my flesh wants to indulge in those temptations, but I also know what obedience to the Lord truly looks like, especially with these five steps. It's that helpful nudge that I need in those moments that I can say, you know what, I can overcome this. The second thing that really stood out to me from this book was John's idea of building trust with the Lord. What does it look like to build trust with the Lord? What does it look like for him to trust you? Similar to obedience, John lays out four points on what it looks like to build this trust. First is unconditional obedience. The second is absolute integrity in all moments and all circumstances. Third is unwavering priority of his desires first. And number four, knowing his heart and always choosing his will. And the formula that supersedes and provides the groundwork for this to actually work is consistency over time. I put these on my watch face because these were two specific areas that I wanted to make goals for this year and really think about more often than just reading the book and then saying, that was good. Now, uh, what next? Those four steps of building trust with the Lord stood out to me because that's something that I desire. I desire to build trust with the Lord and to be so close with the Lord that I can say these things about myself, that I do unconditionally obey the Lord, that I have absolute integrity when it comes to what he says, that I choose his desires first, that I have actually an unwavering priority of his desires and that I always choose his will. That is such a beautiful picture of what it looks like to really be following Jesus and having this awe of him like this book talks about. I would recommend this book for you to read because I really do like that short chapter format where you can easily digest it but still be challenged to do something every day if you read it every day. If you're looking to learn more about what the fear of the Lord looks like, this is a good book for you to read. Because I know for me, I didn't really know practically what it looked like, but I knew factually what it was and still need some help with practically living it out because I am still not perfect and I still fall short often. Check out the link in the description and in the pinned comments to get a copy for yourself. Out of 10, I'd say I'd give this book a solid 9.5 out of 10. C.S. Lewis's book, Mere Christianity, is a book that honestly I didn't really want to read for the longest time because in my mind I was like, yeah, yeah, I already know about Christianity. I'm following Jesus. I know what it's all about. But then after reading this book, it really filled in those gaps that I had about why I believe what I believe. So in this video, I want to share with you a couple of things that I like about this book, what I didn't really like about this book, and then my recommendation to you at the end of this video. There'll be a link in the pinned comments down below for you to get a copy for yourself if you want to check this book out. So I had always known C.S. Lewis as the guy that wrote the Chronicles of Narnia, that kind of stuff. 
saw the movies from Disney, they were pretty good, but I never really read his books. And this was his first book that I read outside of the Narnia series. Well, actually I didn't even read the Narnia series, but this was the first book of his that I actually even read. I was nervous because, I mean, it was written in like, I think the forties or the fifties. And I am a big fan of nonfiction, but like the really old dry English is not something I'm like, okay, this is, uh, this is gonna be a good ride, but it ended up being really enjoyable. <laughs> Funny. Thanks. Yeah, this book was published in 1952, so... Actually, no. Wait. Um... When was this written? 1952, I think. I'm reading wow. it. Yeah, he has some other stuff in here, but. So one of the main things that I liked about this book is how, I guess you can say simple, it's written for the time that it was written. There's a lot of theology that's written in plain terms. And honestly, this is like, I could argue like the basis it provides a basis for apologetics. When C.S. Lewis originally wrote this book, I had to look it up, but he wrote this as a radio show for soldiers during the Second World War. And if you're writing it for a radio show, you can't just preach it as if you're like speaking this to a church, but rather you're speaking this to everyday people, honestly soldiers. So you need to communicate it in a way that's easily understandable. And that's what C.S. Lewis does in this book. I'll put it up on the screen, but some of these chapters, you can see how they are apologetic type conversations. Like these first couple chapters, chapters are the law of human nature, the reality of the law, what lies behind the law, we have cause to be uneasy, the rival conceptions of God, the three parts of morality. Those type of things are common themes in apologetics that Christians often talk about. There's a quote in this book in chapter three, which is the chapter on the shocking alternative, where C.S. Lewis is talking about free will. Do we have it? Do we not have it? And he says here, I think this is on page 48, he says, if a thing is free to be good, it is also free to be bad. And free will is what has made evil evil possible. Why then did God give them free will? Because free will, though it makes evil possible, is the only thing that makes possible any love or goodness or joy worth having. Things like that in the book, these one-liners or, or these short snippets that he then later expounds on, were things that I thought about in my mind, but never really was able to either articulate or put words to until I read C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity. And the way he writes it is that's like so easy to comprehend. Sometimes it's like, okay, well, I know that we have free will, but how do I even like argue that? How would I even say that? You could probably see it. I don't know. I'll, I don't know if that focuses, but I wrote so much in the margins and underlined and circled because so much of it was aha moments or things where I was like, yes, that is so good. And I'm so glad he wrote that. Another neat feature about this book is that I feel like he kind of builds as he goes along. Maybe that was the way he designed his radio talks, but I feel like the beginning of this book is kind of an introduction, kind of dips your toes in. And then towards the end, he goes into really deep, deeper type of things with the Christian faith and following Jesus, which I'm glad he did because if he had just front loaded the whole book with that, I probably would have, I don't know, drowned or something, but I probably would have made it, made it through a book. <laughs> it just would have been a lot if you put it in the front, you know, like if you just, Drink it from a water hose at that point. Or no, a fire hose. Wait, <laughs> what's the phrase? A water hose. <laughs> drink, drink, drink. A fire hose, fire hose, right? Fire hose. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> Kat's the guest star in this video. She's just chilling on the No! Bed. Oh, sorry. I guess C.S. Lewis did design it like that because I totally misread, or not misread, I overlooked the different sections of the book. <laughs> 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 he he put it into different like book sections. You'll see you probably saw it on the screen But it says book one right and wrong is a clue to the meaning of the universe book two what Christians believe Okay, so we get the foundation. What do they believe book three is Christian behavior? So what do Christians do so you go from what they believe to what they do and then book four is beyond Personality or first steps in the doctrine of the Trinity. So that's like, okay What do Christians believe what do Christians do or why do they do it and then deeper theology? So yeah, I guess that does make sense <laughs> The two biggest drawbacks would be one, the style of writing. It's very, what's that word where it's like, oh, you have to have an appetite for it or you have to have a, what's that word? What's that phrase where it's, oh, I can't think of it. What's the phrase where, you know, it's like, oh, some people don't like seafood. It's a, it's a selected taste or it's a, oh yeah, I don't really like carnivore diet because it's a, you know, you gotta have an appetite for it. You gotta have a palette for it, I guess. I don't know, that doesn't sound right. But the way C.S. Lewis writes is that kind of thing where it's like, if you like preference? that preference, maybe, I don't know. He writes in a very cut, dry, rational way of writing. And some people just don't like that. I kind of like it, but there are parts of this where it was hard to get through because 
of that style. The second drawback is that because this is so dense and so, it's just very dense. It took me about, um, let's see, probably like two months to read this because I didn't want to rush through it. I could go back and read it again, but I didn't want to rush the first time around because I really wanted to digest it all. So it takes a little bit of time to get through if you really fully want to grasp and follow what he's saying. If you're considering getting this book, I definitely recommend it because it does provide that foundation for the Christian walk. Like I said at the beginning, there's a link down in the pinned comments for you to check it out or in the description as well. We live in an era where we're told by so many different perspectives how to live a fulfilling life, how not to waste your life. And in John Piper's book, Don't Waste Your Life, he really brings a compelling perspective on how to not waste your life. John Piper talks a lot about in this book how to take risks and make sacrifices that make an eternal impact with the overarching umbrella being making much of God in every situation you're in. In this video, I wanna share with you some of the features that are are included in this book, some of the things I liked about this book after reading it, and then something I didn't like about this book. So make sure to stay to the end so that you don't miss any of the important details of this book. Included in the description and in the pinned comments is a link for you to get the book if you want to after watching this video. So this book is a pretty standard length book. It's 180 pages. I think it's a little less than 180 pages. And there are about, I think, 10 chapters in this. I got this book, I think, the beginning of 2021 after my friends had went to the Passion 2020 conference that they have every year for young adults. I think John Piper was a speaker that for that year and he gave out this book as a free resource for everyone who attended. One of the first things that I liked about this book was how direct he was in writing this book. He didn't really dilly-dally around his idea about not wasting your life and living a life that makes much of Christ. On page 43, he goes into this whole idea. In this section, he's talking about the tragedy of what living what we think a good life looks like. He starts by saying, you may not be sure that you want your life to make a difference. Maybe you don't care very much whether you make a lasting difference for the sake of something great. You just want people to like you. Further on, he says, or if you could just have a good job with a good wife or husband and a couple of good kids and a nice car and long weekends and a few good friends, a fun retirement and a quick and easy death and no hell. If you could have all that, even without God, you would be satisfied. That is a tragedy in the making, a wasted life. He sort of flips the script on everything that all of us have been taught about what a good life the American dream really looks like. And then he starts to dive into this more throughout the rest of the book. John Piper isn't afraid to talk about the hard things and challenge the status quo in this book. That brings me to my second point about what I liked about this book. It's not really a feel good book. He's like, I'm here to tell you how to not waste your life. And if it hurts, it hurts, but it's the truth and it needs to be shared. And I love that kind of writing, that kind of speaking, because so much in our culture today is, I don't want to say soft, but I think things are more compelling when they're sharp and straight to the point. Something else that I liked about this book is that I could read this book knowing that the author was a solid dude. Sometimes you read a book and you don't really know the author that well, or maybe there's some things that you're unsure of about the author, and it makes you kind of read it with more hesitancy. And I think we should always read and, and challenge what we're reading. But John Piper has a solid reputation, especially as a Christian. Somebody who's been following Jesus for years has a proven track record of aligning what he believes and what he does. And so reading this with that confidence in mind made it easier to sort of trust the author with what he was writing. As someone who really loves reading nonfiction books, one thing I don't like a lot about nonfiction books is that oftentimes I can't read them fast. Like my wife can go through I don't know, a thousand page book in probably two days because it's a fiction book. It's like stories and everything. And it's easy to read because you don't really have to apply it necessarily. And so what I find with nonfiction books is that often they have these long chapters that I'm like, wait, I can barely gasp for air because there's so much information packed into this chapter. So what's nice about this book is that he packages it in a way where the sections within the chapter are pretty digestible. This makes it pretty easy to read in short bursts if you want to sit down for, I don't know, five minutes and just read a couple sections in a chapter. Easily doable because there's clean start and stop points. It's a re-readable book. Sometimes I read a book and it's good, but I don't really want to read it again. But with this book, after reviewing it again for preparation for this video, I was thinking, I need to read this again. Why? Because I read this in college for the first time and looking at it again, there's a whole section on what John Piper calls making much of Christ from eight to five, meaning how do we not waste our life 
even in the corporate work world, in our everyday nine to five lives. And so having a whole section in this book called How to Live for Christ and Make Much of Him During the Nine to Five Schedule is something I need to revisit. All right, let's talk about something I didn't like about this book. Honestly, it's so small, like it's not even a big thing. And it's that I kind of wish there was some sort of subtitle to this book or subheading to go along with this book because me and my silly pride uh, back in the day and still to this day, I didn't read it for a while because I was like, don't waste your life. I know how to do that. Just follow God and live for him, which yeah, is true. But there's so much more that John Piper goes in within this book that I needed to hear. And so who knows, maybe a subheading would have helped me read it sooner. But after already being a Christian and hearing a title by a Christian author called Don't Waste Your Life, I assumed it was just an evangelistic type of book that was just talking about how to follow Jesus and why you should follow Jesus. I filled so many of these pages with writings and notes and underlines and squiggles because there was just such good information and challenging ideas throughout. If this book sparked your interest, definitely give it a read. There's a link down in the pinned comments or in the description for you to check it out. The essence of gospel humility is not thinking more of myself or thinking less of myself. Rather, it is thinking of myself less. I remember it was the end of spring break during my junior year of college and I was sitting in Starbucks. I think it was a rainy day and I had just picked up a copy of this book and thought, you know what, why not give this a read? Because I don't have anything else to do. It's the end of spring break and I'm getting ready to go back to school. Tim Keller focuses on 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and 4, and from that he really pulls three main themes from that passage. Those three themes become the anchor of this book for him, and those are the natural condition of the human ego, the transformed sense of self, and finally, how we can get to that transformed sense of self. In this video, I'm going to focus mainly on giving an overview and summary of this book, and then towards the end, I'm going to share some other features about this book, as well as my recommendation about this book. After watching this video, if this book interests you, check out the link in the comments or the description so you can get a copy for yourself. With the natural condition of the human ego, Tim Keller talks about four specific things. That the human ego is empty, that it's painful, that it's busy, and that it's fragile. When it comes to the ego being empty, Tim Keller says that only God can truly fill the ego. Tim Keller says that the ego is painful when it's overinflated or underinflated. In this part, he, he gives a really neat analogy of our bodies and how when our bodies are working properly, we don't really notice them. He mentions about our toes and our feet and how when they're working as they should be, you don't think, oh wow, my toes are really working well right now to keep me balanced and to help me walk. He then connects that to our egos and says our egos should ultimately be like that. They don't draw attention to themselves. However, he does say that our egos are busy in that they are always seeking to draw attention to itself. To itself. Our egos want to succeed. They want to outperform. They want to beat out the competition and rise to the top. And he says that they're they're fragile because if it's an overinflated ego, it's on the brink of bursting and causing destruction. He wraps up this first section saying that ultimately our egos are like black holes. They're insatiable. They're unable to be filled fully. Tim Keller then pivots to the idea of the transformed sense of self and then how we can get there. He looks back at 1 Corinthians 3 and, and notices how Paul really doesn't get his self-worth from what other people are saying about him. He doesn't get his worth from what the Corinthians may think about him. Ultimately, he gets, it, he gets it from what the gospel says about him. It's at this point where Dr. Keller says that quote about what the gospel humility looks like. It's not thinking more of myself or thinking less of myself, but rather it's just thinking of myself less, less frequently, less often. And ultimately, not at all. He also says that our ego should be filled, but not puffed up. Because just as an overinflated ego is dangerous and underinflated and low self-esteem is also dangerous too because neither of those are filled to the right level that they should be. But how do we get to that transformed sense of self? Well, Tim Keller argues that it's by understanding the gospel and what Jesus did on the cross. He says that Christianity is unlike any other religion in that the verdict precedes the performance. All other religions say you have to perform, you have to do this, you have to live by this standard in order to then reach that verdict of, all right, you did a good job, you can reap the rewards of your, your works. But in Christianity, 
it says Jesus performed. Jesus went to the cross and did what needed to be done. Therefore, and, and, and through that, you can perform after. You don't need to perform to receive the verdict, but through Jesus' verdict, it causes us to want to live out what he says, what his commands are, and what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. We don't perform to receive the verdict, but rather we perform because of the verdict that's been set. I think something that's really challenging specifically about this book is that I read this two years ago, and there are things in this book where I know that I haven't applied or can see in my own life that I'm still struggling with. I think about that second part of this book, The Transformed View of Self, where Tim Keller is talking about Paul and, and how he doesn't get his self-worth from others. And he even says that Paul does not look to the Corinthians or to any human court for the verdict that he is a somebody. Paul's self-worth, his self-regard, his identity is not tied in any way to their verdict and their evaluation of him. When I first read this, I underlined it, I started it, but I still find myself struggling to not let the opinion or the ideas of other people sway me in my decisions or in how I interact in situations and circumstances. Even reading this line right here, it says, in fact, his identity owes nothing to what people say. It is as if he is saying, I don't care what you think. I don't care what anybody thinks. And I can pinpoint the areas of my life where that's not the case for me. This book is only 45 pages long and there's large font in this, making it pretty easy to read. I thought I was going to read it in a couple of days, maybe even a week. But once I started reading this, I just flew through it because of how challenging and convicting it is and the way Tim Keller argues what it means to forget yourself. I like to look at this book as something that's a low investment but brings a high return. It doesn't really cost a whole lot because it's so short. You can read it in one sitting and there's even some reflection questions at the end of the book that you can ask yourself and process either by yourself or with a group of people. I recommend giving it a read if any of this video inspired you or challenged you or interests you on looking more into what it means to live in humility and a gospel-centered sense of self. I just finished reading Tim Keller's book called Prayer, Experiencing on Intimacy with God, and I would describe this book as a masterclass on prayer. There are a couple of reasons for this. First is that Tim Keller is such a reliable author. He has experience, he has expertise, and he has time. Sometimes I read a book or hear about a book and I'm hesitant to learn more about it or read it because I don't know the author. I don't know if they can actually be trusted or if they've had a good track record. But Tim Keller is someone, if you are in the Christian space, know he has a reliable and reputable uh, reputation, track record. So I want to share with you some pros about this book as well as a con about this book. Well, I mean, it's kind of a con, but stay to the end because I will share it and break it down for you. If you're considering getting this book and reading this book, I'll leave a link down in the description and the pinned comments for you to check out and grab one for yourself. One of the pros about this book is how much history Tim Keller ties into this book. He really gives an overview of the history of prayer and brings in what it used to look like in the past and how we got to some of the prayers or some of the methods of prayer that we use today. I'm a huge history guy and so reading where Tim Keller would tie in things from the past and connecting them to the future about prayer made this book really enjoyable to read. I love hearing how some of the earlier missionaries from America, like Jonathan Edwards. So reading some of the methods of prayer that Jonathan Edwards used and adapted and modified and implemented in his uh, missionary journeys was really cool to read. In chapter 15 of this book, on the final section on practicing prayer, Tim Keller kind of gives an overview of, let me get to it. He has a section here titled, A History of Daily Prayer. He talks about the Protestant Reformation and he talks about how we got to the term quiet time with the Lord. That's the kind of thing that I don't really read or discover often. And so having this included in this book made it such a, a neat and unique feature. Another strong point about this book is that it's practical. Tim Keller writes in a way that is easily digestible and often makes you go, oh, that's so good, or 
Oh, that's so right. Sometimes when you read something that's super complex, you're like, I don't even know what to take from this. I don't know how to apply it. And I don't even know what I just read. But in this book on prayer by Tim Keller, he just gives it in a way that you just want to keep consuming and you can take something from each chapter and practice it. In chapter two of this book, Tim Keller talks about what is prayer. And one of the quotes that I really liked is how he said that prayer is like a nourishing friendship. Prayer does that with our relationship with the Lord. In chapter 7, Tim Keller talks about the rules of prayer and some of the components that make prayer follow the similar model as seen in Matthew 6 when Jesus is talking about their Lord's prayer. Tim Keller goes into John Calvin's method of prayer and how John Calvin would pray, and he breaks it down in a way that you can apply it for yourself too. Then towards the end in chapter 14, Tim Keller goes into the components of specific types of prayer. So in this section, he's talking about uh, petitioning prayer, which is asking God for things. Those practical, meat-filled sections is what makes this book really enjoyable to read because it goes back to that idea of being a masterclass on prayer. So not only is the history that's included in this book and its practicality two of the strong points about this book, but its helpfulness is another strong point about this book. There are so many times while reading this book that it was just reassuring and comforting to read what Tim Keller was saying. One of the main things that I took away from this book was this idea that we can have confidence praying to the Lord and we don't have to fear about what we're praying because ultimately God is sovereign and he knows what's going to happen. So he's not going to give us something if we pray for it. He's not going to give us everything that we ask for because he knows what's best for us and he knows what will have the best outcome and he already knows what's going to happen. So he's not going to give us something that won't happen or that he hasn't planned already. And so I know in my life, sometimes I ask for something from God and later in hindsight realize that that was a good thing that I didn't get a yes to from God. Had God said, yeah, sure, I'll uh, allow for you to have that. I don't think I would have matured in Christ the way I had. Along the lines of this book being helpful, in chapter 9, Tim Keller goes into the attributes of prayer. He talks about what prayer is, he talks about what prayer requires, what prayer gives, and ultimately what prayer takes us to, and what it results in. Each of those sections is filled with material and wisdom that can be applied and followed after reading this book. Before I share the one con about this book, I want to share what I think was my favorite part about this book. In chapter 12 of this book, Tim Keller is talking about awe and he's talking about praising God for his glory. He writes these beautiful lines about how praising God is what awakens our soul. Praise Praising prayer motivates the other kinds of prayer, both inward prayer and outward prayer. Tim Keller writes, If God's love is an abstraction, then it is of no consolation. But if it is felt in a lived reality through prayer, then it buoys you up. That statement just brought a whole lot of relief and peace to me because that idea of God's love being an abstraction is something I can find myself falling into and saying, Oh, what? is God's love, really. And so by Tim Keller saying that his love can be a lived experience through prayer, then through that, it can buoy you up, help you float, and help you get through life. In my notes, I put a whole bracket and I put an exclamation mark because I was like, this is a strong section that I want to make sure I remember and reflect on as I go back through the notes that I made. Now, if there was one thing that I would say that I didn't necessarily like or that I would kind of forewarn you before you read this book. It's that this book really isn't a introductory book on prayer. This isn't something that if you're wondering what even is prayer and what is prayer at its surface, this book really isn't it. Like I said, it feels like a master class on prayer because he ties in history. He ties in deep theological ideas, not necessarily like complex theological, but like these are some deep things talking about grace and forgiveness and um, multiple layers to it. Sometimes that can be overwhelming if you're just getting introduced to Christianity and the Christian way of prayer and what we believe prayer is. There's so much that I've read in this book that I know that I can revisit and reread because I 
only took a few bits and pieces from it that I'm like, okay, I'm actually implementing this. But there is so much richness to this book that is hard to fully apply in just one reading. Some general features about this book is that there are 15 chapters, 266 pages, and then at the end there are some prayer prompts and different like example template prayers that you can use in certain situations like morning, in the evening, before lunch, before bed, and more. God Has a Name by John Mark Comer was the first time I was really introduced to the author. You may recognize his name from The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry, maybe even Garden City, or even his newest one, Practicing the Way. But I read this during my sophomore year of college, and after reading it, I was so glad I decided to give it a read. So in this video, I wanna share with you an overview of the main idea of this book. I wanna share with you what I, what I took from it, what stood out to me, as well as what I've applied, and then at the end, share some general features about this book. If you're interested in getting this book, it'll be linked at my Amazon storefront, so feel free to check that out. John Mark Comer seeks to answer the question of who is God and what is he like? He really focuses on a book of the Bible, Exodus, specifically chapter 34, verses 4 through 7. This is where God reveals himself to Moses and really speaks to who he is, his character, his nature, to Moses. In fact, it is the most quoted verses, verses in the Bible by the Bible. The author organizes it chapter by chapter, breaking down each verse, each group of verses, at a time. John Mark Homer really drills in the point that God, our God, is a relational God and he wants us to relate to him. God doesn't just want us to know a bunch of facts about him, but rather have a personal relationship with him. So what stood out to me? On page 24, John Mark Homer makes this jarring quote, this poignant quote that says, we become what we worship. From that point, I was like, okay, this is going to be good because he's not swaying away from tough subjects. He just, he's not diverting things that need to be addressed. Something that I thought was really cool was on page 51, John Mark Comer goes into the origin of what does Yahweh mean? Where did we get those? And he really breaks down how the letters have such meaning and are so unique than what we actually think of, Yahweh Adonai. John Mark Homer really drills in the point that God, our God, is a relational God and he wants us to relate to him. What I think was really beautiful about this section was that this is where you kind of see how God, the name Yahweh, isn't just a title. It's a name and it has meaning to it. On page 58, John Mark Homer talks about this idea of God in the Old Testament versus Jesus in the New Testament. And when I read this, I bracketed it, I underlined, circled it, wrote a little note in the margin because it was so powerful for me and so relatable. Let me read it, hang in there because we'll keep going. For years, I thought of Yahweh in the Old Testament as parallel with the Father in the New. Like Jesus is a newcomer in the story. That's wrong and it's dangerous. It leads to a twisted caricature as if the Father is this grumpy old warmonger in the Old Testament and Jesus is the son who, let, who went off to birth and came home with all sorts of radical ideas about grace and love and tolerance and basically said, come on, dad, let's not kill everybody. How about I die for them instead? I could relate to that because though I, at this point in my life, hadn't read through the entire Old Testament, I knew sort of about God and I thought of him in the Old Testament as like, wow, this guy is pretty judgmental. And then I thought of Jesus as like this lovey, like not hippie, but a I felt like Jesus in the New Testament was more loving than God in the Old Testament. And hearing John Mark Comer say that really challenged what I thought about of God for, for a lot of my life. I feel like John Mark Comer's book was really front loaded with so much richness. And even in as you move throughout the book, there's a lot more depth too. But I really took notes and underlined so much in the beginning. So most of what I took away happened in the beginning and that's where most of these quotes and passages are coming from. On page 66, Comer talks about the reality of prayer and how a lot of people get it wrong. And there's one line that really resonated with me and it was that he said, he's talking about prayer. He says, it's when your deepest desires and fears and hopes and dreams leak out of your mouth with no inhibition. It's when you talk to God with the edit button in the off position and you feel safe and heard and loved. It's the kind of relational exchange you can't get enough of. I said, amen at the end of that because that is such a good way of describing what prayer should be. It's this edit button off, autocorrect is off, let's just go to God, vulnerable, 
naked, as John Mark Comer says, and with all authenticity. On page 103 and 107, John Mark Comer gives a diagram and a couple of diagrams of the differences between one monotheism and polytheism, so when you believe in one god versus multiple gods, as well as the differences in the other religions and Christianity. He gives this mountaintop illustration and it really contextualized what I had thought I had known about the structure of Christianity and it was so helpful to read. In the first diagram, you see this idea of polytheism and under the label of the gods, you have all of the gods that could exist that people worship and the different mountaintops that they sit on at the bottom there's humanity and how it compares to our relationship to those gods. Then John Mark Homer talks about universalism and he kind of, not kind of, he explains how some line of thinking says that any religion, any sort of spiritual spirituality can lead you ultimately to God. And then he says, well, sadly, this is not the worldview of Jesus either. It's not polytheism and is not universalism. Then once he gets to monotheism, he looks at one way to think about monotheism, which is, you know, there's humanity, there's all these false gods, everyone's trying to reach God, and we all have to get up the mountain in order to get to God. And the only way to get up the mountain is through Jesus. However, he then goes on to say, here's a better way to think about it, one that's more in line with the actual scriptures, with the actual Bible. He shows Yahweh and how Yahweh's at the top of this mountain and Jesus is the, is the way to, you know what, actually, let me just read it because it's a lot better if he reads it than me trying to fumble over the words. He says, imagine this, instead of one mountain, there are many, and on top of each mountain is a real spiritual being, Zeus or Shiva or the Wiccan mother goddess, call them gods or demons or whatever you feel comfortable with. I like Paul's language of rulers and authority in the heavenly realms. And it's not all that paths lead up different mountains, is that there are different paths up different mountains. But at the top of the mountain is the one true creator God over all the others. And there's no path up his mountain. This God, the only being really worthy of the title of God, in the first place, the one called Yahweh in the Old Testament and God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ in the New, is in heaven, not on earth. And in Jesus, he comes down the mountain. He becomes the rabbi from Galilee to rescue and save the world. It's not so much that Jesus is the only way to God, which he is, but a better way to say is Jesus is God come to us. It was sort of like apologetics wrapped in a nice brownie, I guess, because this is essentially apologetics. Being able to defend the faith and convince, not convince, but being able to say why you believe what you believe. And one of the questions is like, okay, but doesn't everyone every path lead to God? Doesn't every path lead to Jesus? And he says, no. And then he also says, okay, well, doesn't, can't these other religions also be good too? And, and John Mark Homer also says no, and he explains why and shows why. So in the logical part of my brain, I was like, this is good, and this is exactly what I'm enjoying. There are a few other diagrams in this book that really help bring to life and help visualize some of the things that I was thinking and, and still think and some things that in Christianity you believe but don't necessarily know how to visualize or, or put into paper. And so John Mark Homer, by adding those diagrams and visuals, helps bring it to life for me as I read it. Specifically talking about what I've applied, there were a couple of things that I took from this. There were probably more things that I could have taken from this, and maybe I will if I read it again. But one of the main things was meditating on Exodus 34, where God describes himself. I had never really f fully read that section until I read this book. And I had heard it, obviously, because it's quoted so much, knowing that our God is a steadfast uh, or a compassionate God, continuing in steadfast love. Hearing that in like the Psalms when David quotes it, but not actually reading it for myself, being able to meditate on that verse after finally reading it brought a new way of praying and a way of praising God 
in my prayer life. There have been moments where I would just pray that aloud over my time in prayer and it and it's really comforting to know and to say the truths about God because there's no there's no wishy-washy, there's no blurred lines. This is this is exactly what God is saying about himself and how he describes himself so I can boldly proclaim and profess this. I think a second thing that I really applied from this was the idea of God as my dad, as my father, one who I can go to authentically without holding back anything. I knew God was my father, but this book helped bring to life and to hear from somebody else say that, yeah, God is your father and you can relate to him as like, I like to call it like papa, like my papa, you know? Um, I don't know, I just hear it like papa. And I don't know, I think about like French movies and how they call their dads that, but a little cringe, but I don't think so because I love calling God that, even Abba and, and those just intimate ways of connecting with God. This book helped bring that out of what was in my mind. Some general features about this book is that it is, let's see, 261 pages. However, the pages are fun to read because the paragraphs are pretty spaced out and the, the font is unlike other books. The font is a little bit larger, a little bit more wide, but it, it makes it easy to read and paste through because you know you can take it a paragraph at a time, a section at a time, and you don't feel like you're drowning, like everything is jumbled together, thin spacing, one page, you know, when you read those books and like, I can't even, I don't even know where the next line is that I'm reading because it's so close, I think I'm skipping a line. As I mentioned before, there's diagrams throughout this that make it interesting and engaging to continue reading. And then there's, of course, some notes at the back of the book that the author wrote as he was writing the book. This book really helped round out some of the things that I was thinking about God. And it brought my prayer life to life because I could take what was I, I could take what I was reading in this and go out and apply it and practice it. It was so fun to then go and read the Bible and see all the little fingerprints throughout scripture where people are referencing this quote, this passage in Exodus. You see like the Old Testament writers reference it. You see some of the New Testament writers reference it. And it's just so cool how everything ties together in the Bible, especially this verse and how it's carried throughout the rest of the Bible. If you made it all the way to the end of this video, leave a checkered flag emoji because you made it to the final stretch, the last lap, and I am kind of surprised, but also not surprised because you're a loyal viewer. So thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed these book reviews. Again, they're all linked down in the description or in the pinned comments for you to check out on my Amazon storefront. If you like this video, feel free to check out this next one because I think you will love that one too.